power of one. March is Women History Month. We have great women all around the world doing amazing things. Today, I will be speaking with Dr. Ruth from CHOP. She found it not robbery to help all of those youth who are affected by gun violence, who are seen at children's hospital. She has many meetings after meetings to see what she can do to prevent our youth becoming a victim of gun violence. Welcome to the show, Dr. Ruth. Dr. Abaya, please tell me how you began your career at Children's Hospital. Um, so I knew I wanted to be a pediatrician pretty much from when I did my pediatric rotation um, as a medical student. And then when I did residency, it was fairly straightforward to me that I wanted to be an emergency medicine physician as well. So I think those are just the things that felt right in the end. Um, and then when I came to CHOP for fellowship, I loved it. Um, and I loved particularly working in our setting and in the neighborhoods that, that CHOP is located in. Um, and I really just really appreciated the, um, the range of things that we saw in the emergency department, the types of the types of the type of medicine we got to practice, um, and then specifically got interested in firearm violence when I did our tra my trauma rotation as a fellow and saw uh, a lot of victims of violence in that setting. Now, break down for me. You said fellowship. Correct. So um, I did medical school and then residency and then fellowship, which was kind of the first, the last rather um, stage of training. Um, and fellowship is often kind of where you decide what your niche is going to be. And so for me, that was pediatric emergency medicine. And then I knew I was interested in violence, but didn't know exactly how that interest was going to manifest at that time. Okay. All right. Now you are also a professor and program manager, correct? Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm the, the formal kind of title I hold at Penn is um, assistant professor of clinical pediatrics. Um, and all that really means is, you know, working in an academic institution, there's some teaching and some um, work in that academic setting that that's part of that. Um, as far as being a program manager, so that pertains to my health department hat. So at the health department, um, I've run the injury prevention program, which is within the division of chronic disease and injury prevention. Um, and it's a new, it was a new program when I, when I started there. Um, and it was aimed at developing a a focus on, um, on violence within the health department and kind of orienting the city's efforts around a public health approach to reducing violence. So, um, so that was how the role began and it's kind of expanded from there. Um, yeah. Okay, all right. So as you know, gun violence is a very important issue and people are looking for many ways to prevent gun violence in the city of Philadelphia, where we see all too often on the news every day that our young African-American men and women and young children are dying from gun violence. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your research and what have you discovered that can possibly prevent some of this gun violence in the city of Philadelphia? This is an excellent question. So um, I'll speak first about research specifically. Um, so when I was a fellow, we did a little bit of work looking at the overlay or the intersection between behavioral health needs and um, access to firearms and, and exposure to violence. Um, and what we ultimately found was that a lot of kids have access to firearms. That access is both the traditional in the home access and access outside of the home. Um, and that, it, that there was a, a relationship, a correlation between people who had access to firearms and people who had mental health needs that they were identifying in the emergency department, which is concerning. And I think that gets at your second question or the second portion of your question, what are the real preventative measures? And so we talk a lot about things like reducing access to guns, especially for children who are not supposed to have access to guns, of course. Um, but I think that there are some even further upstream ways of addressing demand and thinking about 
what, what are the key real core drivers of violence? Um, what are the circumstances that are facilitating violence in our communities and how do we address those? So that starts to get at these really big problems like poverty and inequity, um, educational attainment, job opportunity. And often these problems seem very entrenched and complicated to resolve. And I don't at all mean to diminish the fact that they're challenging problems, they are. But I think one of the things that I've become a believer in through this work is that as much as we need to try to mitigate the effects of violence and do what we can downstream to minimize the impact of violence, we really have to be committed to this upstream work of transforming the communities in which violence occurs if we want to see a change that is sustained. I think what COVID showed us was that we can make some differences here and there um, with downstream impact or with downstream measures. But if we don't fix the environments that cause violence to thrive, the next big shock, maybe it will be COVID, maybe it will be something different, will just cause all of that to reemerge. If we haven't given people the resources that they need to thrive, it just takes one big shock to destabilize things. And violence is one of many manifestations of that. So. I'm really interested in going upstream. I'm interested in things that, that really deal with people's ability to thrive. Communities that don't have a lot of violence don't not have a lot of violence just because people there are nicer or are less prone to violence. It's because there are all of these other factors that contribute to health and well-being that are more present in some communities than others. So um, I really, really, really believe and um, I think it's essential to continue to say that a true public health approach really needs to move upstream and think about transforming the environment so it's easier to not engage in violence. It's easier to do things that promote thriving. Very, very interesting. <clears throat> because as you know, being the previous executive director for Northwest Victim Services and dealing with those four police districts, the 5th, 14th, 35th, and 39th. The crimes that occur in the 5th police district is very different than the crimes that occur in the 14th, 35th, and 39th. So you have youth that you see that are being shot in the 14th, 35th, and 39th, but it's very rare that it occurs in the 5th police district. Mm. With me coming on to CARES and the CARES responders that I am so fortunate enough to work with, they're looking for trauma training. But one of the CARES responders was saying community-based trauma training, meaning what goes on in a Northwest section of Philadelphia is so different than what goes on in South Philadelphia, mm. what goes on in Northeast Philadelphia, what goes on in the East side of Philadelphia, which is true. Mm -hmm. So all of these communities are dealing with different things. Yeah. Now, do you think poverty plays a role in that with like the different sections of city and the gun violence that's affecting our young African-American children? I do. So if you look at the maps and you look at information that tells you where we see high levels of poverty in Philadelphia, there's an unmistakable overlay with where we see high levels of violence. And there are lots of other things that are true about those areas too. And you're looking at some of the things I mentioned before, educational attainment, et cetera. You're seeing that there's the same communities that keep cropping up as um, disadvantaged in these ways. I always like to say when I say that there are a lot of assets and, and um, really important community structures present in those communities as well. They're not defined by their deficits. And I think it's important to say that, but there is this historic um, disinvestment that's occurred specifically in black and brown communities that we know has been there for you know generations at this point. And these are the after effects, right? We're seeing all of these levels and layers of disadvantage in the same places in Philadelphia. And so, Violence looks different in Northeast versus Southwest, as you, as you mentioned. It may have different drivers. It may have different um, participants, et cetera. But there are these core, and this is why I think um, prevention really needs to go upstream. There are these core drivers that are common to those different geographic locations. And um, addressing those core factors, I think it's, it's reasonable to assume that we would see an improvement in violence if we saw an improvement 
very broadly in um, some of these core indicators. Um, it's difficult to achieve and it's probably achieved differently in different places, right? I think it's important not to assume that, that Philadelphia is a monolith. It's a city of neighborhoods and all of these neighborhoods are different. Um, and some of the problems that are at least co-locating with violence are deeply entrenched. I'm thinking a little bit about um, Northeast Philadelphia and what we know about the drug trade in that location. But what's common to all of these complex problems is, again, we're seeing these layers of disadvantage in the same communities over and over again. Um, and so how do, we, how do we reintroduce opportunity in a way that will last, you know, not just a one-off, not just a few kind of programs, but something that will actually change uh, the outcomes for children growing up in those communities. And then um, how do we reinvest um, in the long term? So those, those are, I think, the things that will probably more seriously um, change, kind of move the needle. Um, but there are lots of other things that, that we can do to intervene um, as well. And I think the, the short-term measures and the, and the kind of near-term measures are, are not to be dismissed. It's just that we really need to think about at the same time, investing in true transformation of those communities. Now, working as an ER doctor at CHOP, do you treat a great deal of youth who suffer from gun violence? So definitely too many. Um, I think that as far as the numbers that, that CHOP sees, there are certainly trauma centers in the Philadelphia area who see more penetrating trauma than we do. It's worth saying a lot of young people are treated in adult hospitals. A lot of um, young people who are technically minors, who are less than 18, um, are being treated in our, by our colleagues throughout the city and they're in trauma centers. Um, but being for being a pediatric hospital, a place where you would hope you would never see that kind of thing, we definitely see far too many. And when the city of Philadelphia saw an increase in gun violence around the pandemic and in the years after, um, we saw similar things at CHOP. So definitely, um, a lot more violence than we should see at a pediatric hospital. Okay. So I don't know with one of your programs, you would like to speak to more co-homicide survivors and victims to shed a greater light for you as to what they experienced and what their need is to better help your research, correct? Absolutely. So I think that one of the things that is really critical in this work is um, gaining wisdom from the lived experience of those who have been victims of violence themselves, who have been immediately um, immediately affected because their family members were victims of violence. Um, I think that lived experience is, is kind of essential because and I think also not only just speaking to what the experience of being of being a victim of violence is and a co-victim of violence, but also living in neighborhoods where violence is common, um, where it's rare to not know someone who has been lost to violence, where the effects and after effects of violence are seen on the streets, where children see them on their way to school. What is that like? And, and how do we speak to that and how that resets norms in those communities in a way that is um, potentially harmful? And so... I absolutely feel that finding a way to engage with victims and co-victims of violence and having all of the different pieces of work that we do being informed by that um, perspective is essential. I, I, I think it's important, and you, you tell me how you feel, I think it's important to have at the table those parents or guardians who are willing to speak that actually at one time or another condoned violence. Hmm. in their home hmm. where they encouraged their their child to inflict harm on someone else and unfortunately dr ruth this stuff actually happens hmm. but I, I really think that this could be so beneficial in your in your research what do you think yeah so i it's interesting that you say that because in a recent conversation this came up this idea that in the background, for a lot of young people who are currently engaged in violence, there are family members, relatives, community members who previously were engaged in violence themselves and may have even encouraged to the point that you're making retaliatory activity, who are pushing a different narrative and doing so maybe more successfully than I would as someone who may not have the same level of 
knowledge and experience of the, of the problem. So is that voice important? Absolutely. Um, I think that there's something to be said for people who understand what the drivers are and can speak intelligently to what the drivers are, what the tensions are, what the beefs are, um, and why a different approach might be warranted. Often we come in and we assume that we kind of know what we're talking about. Um, and we assume that because we've you know, read studies or, or have taken care of patients, that we can speak into someone's life meaningfully. But what we don't understand necessarily are some of these group dynamics um, that are driving the behavior that we see and that are just driving the needs that we see. And so ultimately, if there are people who have better lived experience who can who can speak into the situation, their voice is more powerful. And I think that some of the strongest partnerships are those in which those, those um, trusted community members are participating in the conversation. Dr. Ruth, how did you begin your journey on speaking on gun violence prevention and do you do it nationally? So I began my journey because I took care of a young man in a trauma bay who had been twice victimized by gun violence. And I just remember feeling um, that his story was just, you know, wholly unfortunate and that he had so much potential and there was just no reason for him to kind of be caught up in this cycle of violence. He was otherwise perfectly healthy. Um, and so that was that's the story that I always bring to mind when I think about how I got most interested in this topic. Um, and then as a fellow, um, I did get involved kind of nationally in this conversation, specifically in the world of pediatrics. And so um, I had the opportunity a couple of times to engage with leaders in this field who were trying to kind of push the envelope and, and get us moving in the direction of effective prevention um, around for children. And so um, I did participate in a couple of, of national councils um, just kind of as a trainee learning as I went, um, very junior, of course, at the time. And then um, ever since then, I have learned a little bit more about how to take um, effective action and what it means to build kind of a broad coalition of stakeholders in order to achieve something pertaining to gun violence. And um, I think that there's there have been some good success stories. This is obviously a complicated issue in the United States, but I think there have been some success stories around the country where people with really broad, uh, who come to the issue with really broad backgrounds um, or a diverse set of backgrounds um, are able to actually institute change at a local level. So um, most of my work recently has been very local, but um, there's been, there's con I've continued to kind of stay in touch with people who do this work outside of Philadelphia. Um, and I think that that's been a learning opportunity for sure. Okay, so prevention sometimes very, very, very hard mm -hmm. and complex. Let's think about that youth who is being recruited by a gang and gangs have changed in the city of Philadelphia. They're, they're now going off of blocks. But think about that child who is being recruited, mm -hmm. who is afraid to tell his parent, parents, teacher, and he has to join that gang in order for him not to be harmed or killed. How do we save those children? Yeah, so I think this is part of why the, and I'm gonna speak in generalities and I'll apologize for that, but I think it's a little bit appropriate. It's so important to kind of look a little bit more upstream and at a community level rather than an individual level. I think this exemplifies that need. So focusing on that young man would be a little bit problematic, right? Because there are all of these forces you just described that are influencing his decision-making um, that are difficult for him to control as a young person that he doesn't even feel he can share with the adults in his life. But if you provided opportunities for his entire group of friends, his peers, then you're changing the whole environment, right? Not just trying to change his behavior and say, you don't join a gang or a group, but rather you're saying, here are all these opportunities for all of these, the young men in this community that um, kind of divert away, ideally, from the behavior they may be engaged in if they're part of a gang or a group. Um, I do think sometimes for young people, there are more options for help than they realize. And so um, 
making sure that they feel empowered to mention these kinds of things to the right people is important, right? They think, you know, because of maybe the threats that they've been, re- that they've been receiving, they have a perception of risk. And sometimes that's real and sometimes that isn't. But keeping the lines of communication open are important. But then I really just have to put in a plug for changing the whole environment. I mean, you're your goal in the scenario you just described is not just that young men, but that whole group of young men, right? If we could do something for that whole group of young men, rather than trying to generate a way to extricate just that one young man from the situation, um, that's, I think, how we really change the narrative more substantially. Okay. Okay. Now you spoke a little while back about your sister hospitals, if you will, who treat young people Do you rely on collaboration from the other trauma hospitals in the city of Philadelphia to be able to gain more knowledge? And I'll call out my my good friend, Scott Charles at at Temple University Hospital, who is doing a amazing, amazing work. And Temple Hospital has 24-hour advocates providing advocacy real time to all victims and co-homicide survivors that that are treated and seen at, at Temple Hospital. How does working with other trauma hospitals help with your research with gun violence? So I think that collaboration is really essential. Um, there have been a couple of efforts that that the health department has has tried to start in the last year or so that have been all about that. So for example, we formed a coalition of, of all the hospital-based violence intervention programs, and we're very grateful that Scott Charles is a member of that. And similarly, we've, we've been trying to build a coalition of all of the cure violence programs. And I think it's exactly for the reason that you're outlining. Um, this really is a problem that's best solved with all of us working together. Um, and I think that there's a lot to learn. Every hospital system has different programs, different rules of operation. I think we all learn from each other's experience. Um, I think we also learn about what's driving the violence from one another because we see some of these some of these incidents kind of crossing, uh, you know, zip codes, crossing neighborhoods, and we can put the pieces together better if we're all collaborating. Um, I think we also want to make sure that there's a single standard of care ideally, for all Philadelphia residents, right? And so if you're injured in the city of Philadelphia, um, I think our dream is that everyone would receive the same type of comprehensive um, trauma-informed support after an event like that. And so that's the other reason collaboration, I think, is really important, is so that we can have a uniform approach. And no matter where you're injured, there's, there's some level of support you can count on. And that is true, Dr. Ruth. If anyone who is watching this program and you were a victim of a crime or you are a co-homicide survivor, anyone and everyone knows that they can always reach me and I'll be more than happy to assist you. And you can reach me at 267-808-0350. But please know there are community-based agencies all throughout Philadelphia that work with the police districts and they will be able to offer free services for you and your family members, and most importantly, therapy. So before we wrap up, Dr. Ruth, therapy, extremely, extremely important. And what I'm finding is that the community-based agencies have a waiting list for therapy. How can you ask that mother or father, grandmother, grandfather, guardian, or even shooting victim? to wait to receive therapy. What do you think some solutions are for these community-based agencies not to have a huge waiting list and for us to be able to help those in need that really need that therapy? Because sometimes hurt people hurt people, right? Right. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. You know, my understanding is we really are grappling with a national shortage. Um, There's just a real 
kind of crisis of mental health. We've seen it a lot in the pediatric setting where there's just more need than there are people to meet it. And so, you know, waiting lists are kind of everywhere for every level of care. Um, and so, you know, what are the ways in which we incentivize providers to, to work in our city? How do we improve the pipeline so we're bringing up more people with this skill set? How do we temporize by making sure that enough people have access to mental health first aid and know how to recognize a crisis and respond to it appropriately? Um, how do we maximize things like peer support um, and, um, and kind of groups that provide a little bit of, of support in, in while people are waiting to kind of get connected to a professional? Um, these are some of the things that I've certainly heard in conversations, I think conversations that are happening around the country, because again, it's, I think it's a national challenge. Um, I do think that one of the things I get most excited about when I think about this is, again, you're, we always have to be thinking about what we need right now, but also what we're going to need in the next few years is that pipeline. You know, how do we bring up especially people who are from communities of color, who are um, who have lived experience and then would have the training to provide that type of um, culturally competent therapy and build you know, real relationships of trust. That feels like a real opportunity to me. Um, so those are some of the ideas that I know um, are out there. And I think the question is, how do we operationalize that so that the needs that we're seeing right now are being met? Dr. Ruth, I thank you so much for all that you are doing. Please do not grow tired. Keep pushing forward and know that I am your number one fan and I commend you for everything that you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining me today. My hat's off to all of the women who are doing amazing things around the world. Please keep doing what you're doing. It makes a difference. You don't have to reach hundreds. You don't have to reach thousands. As long as you are reaching one person and making a difference in their lives, you could be the one to change the world. Thank you for joining me today.